Hello again. How are you? Today we're talking about developmental theories of crime in our overview of the different theoretical perspectives related to crime and criminology. And the developmental theories I think you'll find bring together some of the materials that we looked at in other chapters on theory. So those previous chapters dealt with a lot of older theories, theories from like the, I don't know, 1950s, 60s, 70s, some of those. Now we're going to look at more contemporary type theories. Uh, first though, Sheldon and Eleanor Glick, uh, they actually uh, have developed their work in the 1950s and uh, we looked at some of their work before, a chapter on biology. What they did, interestingly enough, was look at family relations in their huge study, they did this study of um, over 500 young people and uh, many, many variables and came to find that family relations were the most important for the idea of those who would be persistent offenders. And so this is noteworthy because this is all about human development, the way that we change and grow over time. There are two big theories or I should say two branches of the theories that we'll look into here. Uh, one is these uh, latent trait theories and the other are these life course theories. But together these two really are focused again on uh, the development of a criminal career, so how a criminal identity comes to be. And the idea is that there was increasing concern over, you remember that Philadelphia cohort study, the, the 5% who were just chronic recidivists. Uh, the idea of chronic offending got people's attention and they wanted to know why is there this chronic offending? What can we think about with it? How can we theorize it to change it? And the idea of aging out, the fact that criminals sometimes just stop engaging in crime after a certain point in their lives. Those two things together were the impetus behind these developmental theories. So again, the two different theoretical branches here. First, the life course theories. This is the idea that a person's criminality is going to be influenced by a lot of individual characteristics, traits, and their social experiences. Um, so those are over the life course. Latent trait theories, on the other hand, uh, the idea here is that human development is controlled by some type of master trait, uh, some type of trait that is present around birth that then influences person throughout his or her life. So first let's look at the theories falling under the life course category. Uh, they mention in your textbook what's called problem behavior syndrome and this is, uh, the acronym is uh, PBS. Uh, they say this is a group or a, um, a collective of antisocial behaviors that work together, a clustering of these. Things like eating disorders, hard drug use, increased alcohol consumption, uh, suicidal thoughts. These are things that may not necessarily be criminal, but that often are seen together again like I said in clusters related to antisocial behaviors that then can also be connected with criminal practices. The pathways to crime idea is the work of Rolf Lober and he has come up with three different pathways. Uh, the first one to know the authority conflict pathway. Uh, this is one of a, a sort of a general troublemaker young person. Uh, usually an early age child, a young child, begins expressing or um, presenting very stubborn behavior, which is connected with defiance, uh, the idea of I'm going to do it my way, and you're not going to tell me how to do things, and general disobedience. Now that that defiance uh, idea and the, um, the idea of uh, disobedience combines with authority avoidance. So you've got kids who are inclined in a certain way with a personality 
with certain behaviors, like for example avoiding authorities by staying out late, not going to school, or running away from home. So there's a pairing of the personality traits and certain other kinds of uh, behavioral things to get away from authorities. Uh, Lober mentions two other pathways, the covert pathway and the overt pathway. The covert pathway is minor underhanded behavior, it talks about things like lying and shoplifting that leads to property damage. So this can escalate to some things like joyriding, passing bad checks, stealing cars, this type of thing, but probably not uh, the same kind of category as this authority conflict uh, type. That's the covert pathway. And covert usually means um, hidden or uh, under, so not as prominent. An overt pathway to crime means you know more prominent, more visible. And this is the idea of um, behavior escalating into aggressive acts that begin uh, with this aggression, annoying people, bullying them, and then leading into violence, uh, like attacking someone and the idea of theft, forced theft. One crucial thing to know about developmental theories. Most life course theories suggest that these persistent criminal careers, the ongoing criminals, are affected in a great way by the early onset of some of these tendencies. So the earlier a young person expresses some of these behavioral characteristics and tendencies, that suggests um, that they will likely be more like longer career criminals. Your text also mentions some research by Samson and Laub, which is the idea of uh, age-graded theory. And one of their big findings that I'd like you to know, that the idea of um, certain turning points in a criminal career can be things like becoming married and gaining uh, some type of, of different career, um, a legal, legitimate career. So the notion that there may be these crucial turning points um, are very, very useful for stopping even those people who are involved in crime at young ages from doing this in the future. And there's a wonderful study which precedes these developmental theories by Clifford Shaw, and um, it's called the Jack Roller. And fascinatingly enough, this is a term for uh, these young kids who in the 1930s would basically um, steal from rob alcoholics uh, on the street. They'd roll them over and take their money. And interestingly, the, the guy's name is Stanley, the kid. He starts to change when he, exactly as Samson and Laub argue, he starts to develop a career and he gets married. And that's a turning point for him in his view of himself and he completely desists from his previous life of crime, which was rather involved, he started becoming a juvenile delinquent. I think started running around, uh, running away from home at about age six. One additional element that they mention is a concept I'd like you to know, knifing off. And it's an offender leaving his or her environment and getting what they called a new life script. And one example would be the idea of uh, joining the military, that this is a turning point for some people who have been delinquent or uh, juvenile offenders. So uh, a quote from your textbook, it says, drawing uh, from a study of, what was it, um, how many people, 52 men uh, as they approached age 70, drawing on the men's own words, they found that one important element for going straight was this knifing off and joining the military, um, as does marriage or changing residence, can allow this because the knifing off, you can think of the metaphor of a knife, just cutting off from the past and, and leaving it. Here's a quote from one of the former delinquents who was approaching 70 years old. I'd say the turning point was, number one, the army. You get into an outfit, you had a sense of belonging, you made your friends. I think I became a pretty good judge of character. And I'll skip ahead here. It says, then I met my wife. I'd say probably that would be the turning point. 
getting married then naturally kids come so now you got a better job you get to make more money and that's how I got to the Navy Yard and tried to improve myself okay. next there's considerations of latent trait theories and what's known as the general theory of crime and that has been um, expressed in some ways by um, Travis Hershey and Michael Gofferson. Um, the idea here is that chronic offenders really are in the moment. They possess what they call a here and now orientation. And that's a fascinating thing because it involves something perhaps like impulse control, that they don't see perhaps longer term consequences or think in terms of longer term goals. So the characteristics of that particular orientation, again, according to uh, Gofferson and Hershey, a general insensitivity to other people's feelings. Have you ever known anyone who has that? Uh, that can be related to someone not really caring and breaking social norms quite readily. Uh, also, they found that these are more physical types of people. Uh, they engage in risk-taking, which goes perfectly with this idea of impulsivity and here and now mentality. Uh, also too short-sighted, can't see the consequences perhaps that are coming. And then finally, and this is an important characteristic, nonverbal, the idea that some people might not be able to communicate uh, what they're feeling or thinking, but simply act on it, uh, which means that they're not able to analyze uh, what's going on in their minds and deal with it in perhaps a more appropriate manner. Here again, Godfreyson and Hershey are indicating that the root cause of poor self-control is found in inadequate child rearing. Again, fascinating to consider you know, the old expression, how far does the apple fall from the tree, really? And the idea that in those formative developmental years, that young people are really maybe becoming the people who they'll be. And so inadequate child rearing, you might recall we also talked about in an earlier chapter about the idea of um, institutions of socialization, places like the family, right, and how that might teach a child or not teach a child uh, how to behave and how to control themselves and um, give them a sense of self-respect and status or not. There are criticisms though of the um, idea of this general theory of crime. Uh, one of them is it's tautological, which means the idea of circular reasoning. It, it's basically saying uh, that kids might engage in crime because they're not socialized appropriate or they didn't have good child rearing practices. Well, they didn't have good child rearing practices and so then they're going to engage in crime. There's some tautological reasoning there. Another thing they mention too are different classes of criminal. So for example, is there a difference between white collar criminals? Um, say for example, people are engaging in embezzlement who otherwise might have very good self-control versus those who are more impulsive. Okay? It also does not mention much ecological issues or the environment in which people live. The idea that we talked about um, with things like rational choice theory, to what extent is your environment um, giving you criminal opportunities or not. There are also significant racial and gender differences that we found with patterns of crime. This theory doesn't address that. Uh, the role of moral beliefs. You might recall when I asked you that question if you would steal a million dollars. I told you about the students who I've asked that question of. Some of them said, uh, I was raised not to do that. You know, I, I couldn't live with myself. So what's the role of moral beliefs in changing people's attitudes toward crime or creating them in the first place? Um, some other big ones, the influence of peers. We all know how peers can influence us and may be very, very different from the type of child rearing practices that we had in our homes of origin. There's a funny notion too here. People do change. Uh, they change biologically and they change socially and they certainly change over the developmental stages of the life course. So the ultimate finding is, is there a modest relationship 
between self-control and crime. And it seems like that's the case. That's really the best that we can do with this theory. Also, too, uh, there isn't much consideration of the idea of cross-cultural differences. Why is it that sometimes in, in certain countries that are um, much poorer, there might be very, very different patterns than, for example, in the United States? There's uh, more work in this chapter by uh, Colvin and his notion of differential coercion theory. This is kids who experience a certain type of discipline called punitive discipline. Uh, punitive means, of course, very harsh. Um, so if kids, for example, are physically attacked at home and they face things like psychological coercion, um, that is very damaging to children. Um, those children have what Colin called high con um, coercive impulse. So coercive um, coercion is the idea of, of forcing people to do something. And those high coercive impulse, um, you could almost say they're kind of also corrosive <laughs> impulses, they produce a high level of self-directed anger, um, self-hatred. Because if you're constantly being berated by people who are supposed to support you, like your parents or your family, and um, physically punished and psychologically tormented, of course, you're going to wonder what's wrong with you. So that idea of self-directed anger. Low self-esteem, not feeling good about yourself, of course. Weak social bonds. Uh, you're not necessarily going to care so much about what other people think, and in particular if you had a nasty relationship with the people who raised you. Uh, also, too, potentially a feeling of resignation, like a, a hopelessness or an apathy that you really can't do anything about that situation. And that is a terrible thing because if someone doesn't understand that they have some agency, that they have control, um, then they just feel uh, like they they don't have any reason to, to do anything, right? I might as well act bad, I might as well act good, it doesn't matter. Finally, uh, that can be related to this declining self-control idea, because if other people around you are acting on their impulses all the time, why shouldn't you? Finally in your chapter, there's also the work of Farrington that's discussed, and the idea of antisocial potential which uh, as a long-term or short-term phenomenon, uh, the idea of an antisocial personality has gained a lot of traction in the last couple decades as maybe related to crime. Uh, and the fascinating thing about this theory is that uh, Farrington is suggesting that certain persistent traits could be observed in offenders very, very early, by the age of eight. So again, the idea of um, what Freud once said the child is the father to the man. Uh, the child is going to be the, the future of who that person is going to become. And maybe some of those traits are set far earlier um, than uh, we might have even thought at one point.